Edward C. Harwood is one of the 20th century's most powerful voices for economic science, sound money, and market freedom. He explained credit cycles at the start of the Great Depression. He resisted the New Deal. He debated John Maynard Keynes on economic theory. He resisted wartime censorship with courageous defiance. Let me warn you, and let me warn the nation. He founded the first independent research institute in the United States, the American Institute for Economic Research, which today remains a home for excellence in scholarship, teaching, and commentary. This is the story of his life and work. The second of four children, Edward grew up in the suburbs of Springfield, Massachusetts. At the age of 17, he was accepted into the U.S. Military Academy of West Point. I uh, volunteered for World War I, but uh, happily served at West Point where I didn't get shot at. And I continued in the regular Army Corps of Engineers until 37. I retired, but uh, in 1940, I volunteered to return to active service because World War II was on the horizon. I retired at the end of World War II after 26 and a half years of military service and uh, returned to continue with the Institute. When Korea broke, I volunteered for that, but they told me I was too old. graduating with an engineering degree in 1920. He then entered Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where he took three more degrees, including one in business administration. He was appointed a teaching professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, just as the Great Depression hit. Bank buying stabilized things for a few days, but on October 29, Black Tuesday, the bottom dropped out. The average price of major stock falling nearly 40 points, with chaos at the New York Stock Exchange. In the 1920s, the government had gotten heavily involved with manipulation of the money supply shortly after the creation of Federal Reserve. A lot of people were thinking that they were going to be able to be helping out, to be preventing crises. It turns out what Harwood was suggesting, that they were actually leading to an overinflation of the money supply, to increasing of credit. And this increases in credit fueled by government inflation was eventually going to lead to a destabilization of the economy. He had already warned of its coming. In 1929, he wrote in The Analyst, the time may not be far distant when the country will realize, in the light of the cold gray morning after, that it has just been another credit splurging spree. During the 1920s, the quantity of money in the U.S. economy ballooned owing to the monetary policy implementations of the Federal Reserve. There were two particular bursts of credit expansion by the Fed, one in 1924 and another in 1927, which resulted in the currency outside banks plus time and demand deposits to increase from $44 billion to over $55 billion between 1924 and 1929. This had the effect of not only pushing interest rates down, but driving stock prices through the roof. Between 1924 and 1929, the S&P 500 index more than tripled. E.C. Harwood was one of the first and only economists in the 1920s to say, look out, some of this prosperity that we think might be real actually might be fueled by inflation created by the government. And he saw this many times throughout the 20th century where other economists thought that the government was stabilizing the economy, he saw the government was actually destabilizing the economy. Once the Fed began tightening the money supply and raising interest rates during the spring and summer of 1929, it wasn't long before the bubble burst, reaching a culmination on October 28th and 29th, 1929. The prevailing view of the Depression 
was that it could be fixed by government spending and credit expansion. Based on his reading in economics, he strongly disagreed. His writing on economics began as a hobby, but it became a profession over time. In 1932, his book Cause and Control of the Business Cycle was the first evidence-based work to push an alternative explanation. The downturn was not due to market forces, but to central bank manipulation of the money supply, he argued. The book was featured by the Book of the Month Club and adopted in economics classes at both Stanford and Dartmouth University. Trained as an engineer, Harvard had found a niche in elucidating and defending classical economics and sound money at a time when both were out of favor. In this task, his colleagues and collaborators included Gottfried Hobbler, Friedrich von Hayek, Ralph Hotry, Henry Hazlitt, and William Harold Hutt. The stock market went crashing in 1929. And the deep down depression set a vision on a fiscal decline. Franklin Delano Roosevelt had a plan and a view. He became the U.S. president and saved the nation with a brand new deal. More gasoline, more clothes, more tires, and more beer. What inflation has done before, it will do again. Everything's looking up. Throw out the chest. Get into step. Snap into it. What a man and what a leader. Yowzer. Happy days are here again. Let's return now to Colonel Edward Harwood of the American Institute for Economic Research in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. Uh, Colonel Harwood, uh, uh, since the Roosevelt period into World War I, into Korea, I guess it's since uh, 1945, this country, however, has enjoyed uh, fantastic progress, uh, technological progress. Uh, in the last uh, 50 years, we've uh, gone from a propeller, small propeller airplane to rockets on the moon. I mean, th this uh, country has progressed, it seems, to most people anyway, in transportation, in roads. But don't you think that... Um, uh, the uh, presidents of the past and the economics of the past have contributed to this progress, or do you think that it's all heading us into a disaster? Well, I think in the first place, there is no question that we are heading into a disaster. The only doubt at the moment is whether the disaster will be postponed a couple of years by an abortive cyclical recovery before inflating is resumed. I would not say that all the efforts of the presidents of the past have been wasted, and I'm sure that their intentions were for the best. But you know, they say hell is paved with good intentions, and I'm afraid we have some rather difficult times ahead. Franklin Delano Roosevelt took office in 1933. FDR issued several executive orders that ran contrary to everything Harwood had warned against. He shut the banks, preventing depositors from having access to their money. He issued a confiscation order for all gold held by private citizens, complete with criminal penalties for refusing. He then devalued the dollar from its definition at 1 20th per ounce to 1 35th per ounce. Argentina is in the midst of a deepening economic crisis. With inflation forecast to hit 50% this year, Argentinians are struggling to make ends meet. It tiene como medio kilo. 80 pesos we paid for this piece of beef. 80, and it just goes up and up, and we are trying to catch up. But my husband's salary doesn't go up in the same way, and that's the problem. <laughs> So in other countries around the world today, we see the government actually, such as in Argentina, saying you can't withdraw your money, and then all of a sudden they devalue the currency and people freak out and think, what happened to all my savings? I have some news for you, folks. I was just talking to old man Potter, and he's guaranteed cash payments to the bank. The bank's going to reopen next week. But, George, I got my money here. Did he guarantee this place? Well, no, Charlie. I didn't even ask him. We don't need Potter over here. And I'll take mine now. No, but you're... 
You, you're, you're thinking of this place all wrong, as if I had the money back in a safe. I, the, the money's not here. Many people think, well, that's far away. The United States government would never do that. It turns out they actually did do that. They required Americans to turn in their gold, and then they told people that they couldn't withdraw it. And then when they eventually allowed them to actually spend money, it was devalued basically by 40%. So that caused a lot of turmoil in the economy in general, uh, especially with the financial sector, with the banking sector. Well, your money's in Joe's house, that's right next to yours, and in the Kennedy house, and Mrs. Maitland's house, and, and a hundred others. Uh, you're lending them the money to build, and then they're going to pay it back to you as best they can. Now, what are you going to do, foreclose on them? I got $242 in here, and $242 isn't going to break anybody. Okay, Tom. All right. Here you are. You sign this. You get your money in 60 days. For 60 days? They took almost half of American savings. People realized that the government could actually steal half of their money at any given time, and there was nothing they could do about it. So the American Institute for Economic Research was founded in large part to bring attention to the perils of government manipulation of the banking sector, of the perils of government inflating money, devaluing the dollar, the gold, and then actually explicitly telling people, yeah, we're not actually going to give you back this money that you thought you had. Neither liberty nor property were safe, and Harvard decried these actions as legalized embezzlement. He saw the need for an independent voice. He was encouraged by friends at MIT to found a new research center of which he would be the head. It would serve as an intellectual counterweight to the new orthodoxy in government and on campus. He knew that in doing so, he would be stepping outside of his role as army officer, but in his oath, he had sworn to uphold the Constitution as his primary duty. Washington did not agree. On November 20th, 1935, Harwood received a letter from G.B. Pillsbury, the acting chief engineer for the Army Corps of Engineers. Harwood must abstain from political discussions of any kind. His writings on economics must be strictly curtailed. The action had been initiated by Lauchen Curry, a former Harvard professor who was one of Roosevelt's closest economic advisors. Over the following weeks, the demands intensified to the point that he was told to relinquish all rights and privileges of a private citizen. Harwood was at least facing some form of administrative censure and conceivably, in the worst case scenario, might have received pressure to resign his commission. That would have resulted in the loss of his pension and military benefits. Given that the Roosevelt administration had no qualms about suppressing critics, the case of John T. Flynn being just one example, it was brave of Harwood to persist. It was clearly a political attack. Harwood would not be silenced. He continued to write, though not always under his own name. He retired from the Army in 1938, but re-enlisted again in 1941 in the Second World War. The letters from Washington began anew. In March 1941, Harwood received an unexpected visitor from Washington. The Adjutant General's office was opening an investigation of him over the appearance in the weekly bulletin of January 13, 1941 of the American Institute for Economic Research of a matter critical of the President of the United States. Since Harwood still remained a trustee of AIR, the War Department considered this position subject to military rules governing the political activities of soldiers. Curry wrote again, in view of the fact that you are a senior official at the American Institute for Economic Research, the War Department must consider that you have at least partial responsibilities for the publications of that institute. Therefore, the Secretary of War has directed, A, that you use such means as are at your disposal to prevent the appearance in the weekly bulletin of the American Institute for Economic Research of articles which are in violation of War Department or other legal restrictions on articles published by the Army officers or that B, you terminate your active participation in the activities of the American Institute for Economic Research. Harwood would not relent. He noted that one of FDR's proclaimed four freedoms included the freedom of speech and expression everywhere in the world. Harwood declined to follow the directives. Until I receive 
definitive evidence to the contrary, he said. I shall assume that the position I have taken is in accord with the wishes of my commander-in-chief as well as the dictates of my own conscience. Later evidence came to light that Curry was working as a Soviet spy. As a senior military officer, combat veteran, and someone who had vocally criticized the economic policies of the U.S. government on several occasions, Soviet agents may have thought that Colonel Harwood was a potentially high-value source of intelligence, but they couldn't have been more wrong. Harwood's disapproval of post-New Deal U.S. economic policy came from a constructive and patriotic instinct, not a revolutionary or seditious one. Harwood had been targeted as an intellectual dissident. It wasn't only about politics. Harwood had long emerged as a leading opponent of John Maynard Keynes' economics. They sparred in a series of articles in 1934, beginning with Keynes' open letter to FDR. Harwood responded that Keynes was merely pushing more inflation by an indirect route. Keynes responded, The article which you contributed to the American press concerning my open letter to the president just came into my hands. The view you have expressed is one which has been widely held by economists indeed. I held it myself 10 years ago. I believe now, however, that it involves a fundamental fallacy which runs through most applications of the classical theory, the political economy, to practical affairs. I would say that my views are primarily based on uh, economic practicalities. Uh, I don't think that uh, I'm a hard-hearted uh, person who has no sympathy for the underdog. Quite the contrary, I'm uh, very much inclined to believe that we have established too many ways in which special privileges are granted, and we forget that special privileges are granted always at the expense of somebody who loses some of his uh, privileges. Harwood carried on the correspondence through many successive rounds, refuting Keynes point by point. He was one of the few American economists to do so. Returning from war in 1945, Harwood sought a permanent home for AIER. He found it in the abandoned home of the Berkshires of Western Massachusetts. It had belonged to Mr. and Mrs. Prentiss L. Coonley of Lake Forest, Illinois, since 1926. It had been purchased from Dr. Frederick Stark Pearson, a world-famous industrial engineer. Pearson had in turn bought it in 1902 and built a wonderful estate. But shortly after completing his estate, he and Mrs. Pearson went down with the Lusitania off Ireland in 1915, when it was sunk by a German submarine during the First World War. After raising the Pearson's wooden Victorian-style home, the Coonleys began building their 31-room stone house on and around the original foundation and amid Pearson's neglected formal gardens. As a Chicago businessman and stock speculator, Mr. Coonley had to abandon construction of Cotswold Cottage when he lost most of his money in the Great Depression. From the Pearson deaths, through Coonley's misfortunes until the early 1940s, the grounds suffered from neglect. Except for frost-tumbled marble fountains, frost-cracked goldfish pond, and marble benches under rusting grape arbors, the original Pearson formal gardens were indistinguishable from overgrown fields. The stone house was very bland. It was, it had been, uh, I think in 1945 when Colonel Harwood came in, it was not finished and uh, the people who built it had uh, abandoned construction in 1932 or 1933. They ran out of uh, money. They lost a great deal in the market and never finished it and abandoned construction. So he bought it and uh, he came in and finished it. AIR bought the main house, outbuildings and at 110 acres for $25,000, sold the Cambridge property for a similar amount, and moved operations to Great Barrington, Massachusetts. The staff began clearing away the debris, painting walls and woodwork, and finishing floors, and within several months, AIR was operating at its new base with plenty of room for future expansion. The move was announced to members in AIR's research reports, August 6, 1946. By 1956, subscription and booklet sales had outgrown its allotted space among the ground floor offices, 
1957, the mail-in and printing were transferred to an annex, which was built with an underground connecting passageway to the stone house among the remains of the old gardens. In 1958, a warehouse was added to the annex to accommodate increasing volumes of paper, envelopes, and mail. To accommodate the expansion of research staff, students, and books, in 1963, a research library was added to the hillside below and connected to the annex. Known as the E.C. Harwood Library, this 10,000-square-foot building now contains AIR's principal's offices. Additional staff and student housing were added in 1968 along the curve of the hill to the east of the E.C. Harwood Library. The times were right. The country was facing yet another dollar crisis. This time, the reforms would end the connection of the dollar to gold permanently. The new system would be a pure paper money system, the very one that Harwood had warned against. Unhinged from any connection to sound money, the central bank would be in a position to inflate without limit. Harwood again called it. He recommended gold as an investment for decades. Those who followed his advice after 1974 did very well for themselves, and they became supporters of AIR. I remember uh, back in the 70s when I was young and single, and I had a lot of seemed like I had a lot of free time. One summer, I spent a lot of time clearing brush outside of these windows, and it became like a personal thing. I just decided that had to be cleared. So on weekends, I would go out there and clear the brush. And Colonel Harwood was here that summer for a couple of months, I remember, and he was about to leave for Switzerland or California where he had a retirement home. One morning, he came walking into the press room and I thought, good morning, Colonel, you know, you know, you're looking for something in particular. He said, no, no, I'm not looking for anything. I'm looking for you. You know, I'm headed out this morning. I said, yeah, well, I, I hope you have a good summer or what's left of it or whatever. And, uh, and he said, but I want to give you a token of uh, appreciation for your efforts here. And uh, he pulled out a Krugerrand, a gold coin, um, handed it to me, and I thought, that's an ounce of gold. I said, what's, what's that about? He said, well, I appreciate what you're doing around here. And he said, I just wanted you to have this. And I said, well, well thank you. <laughs> you know? We originally started recommending gold stocks in 1958. There were developments at that time that convinced us that the U.S. government would not attempt to save the dollar, that it would uh, eventually close the gold window and let the dollar go, as it has. And uh, interestingly enough, the gold stocks that we recommended in 1958 uh, worked out better during the next uh, seven years than the Dow Jones averages. That may be very surprising to a number of people. He actually did that a couple of times with me, something like that. And uh, it, I think that helped cement that I was going to stay here a, a while. Today, AIR is undergoing a renaissance as a leading voice for market economics and sound money, with its scholars writing for both popular and academic venues and bringing in students from all over the world to our offices and home in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. AIR's Bastiat Society brings together entrepreneurs and intellectuals in local meetups all over the world. Media appearances by our researchers are increasing. Our book publishing program has been revived with both reprints and new works. It's a beautiful thing to observe the endurance of an idea. For AIR, this idea is human freedom as it relates to the material world. Pure freedom, E.C. Harwood called it. This is the source of inspiration for this institution, both the driving passion and the goal. AIR is a tribute to the difference a lone but courageous voice can make in shaping the world. <laughs>